Hey, everyone. Welcome once again to There's Just Something About Kansas City. As we drop a new episode here, uh, as we talk and we're in conversation with the people, places, and things that make Kansas City such a great place to live. And got Andy Rieger in here today. Couldn't be happier about that with Rieger Distillery. And uh, the he is the founder and the owner of Rieger. And you have a terrific story to tell, I think, young man. I can say that to you because you have all your hair and I don't have any. We were just making a little joke about this before we went on. First thing Andy said was? I said, where'd your hair go? <laughs> it left. <laughs> stage left, my friend. It left stage left. Yeah. And how are you? How are things with Andy Rieger? Great. We are, uh, you know, at, whether it be family or company, I mean, everything is kind of moving in the direction that you at least plan, which is what we all hope for in life, that whatever you set your sights out to do, you actually are able to set guidelines and parameters and hammer it out. And that's kind of the way that, like I said, both personal and professional are going at the moment. Yeah. First local distillery uh, since the prohibition right here in Kansas City, which is terrific. You dedicated it back on the day of the 100th anniversary of Union Station, which coincided pretty well. But your story to get to this point with your family, the name, the old distillery all the way back to uh, through Prohibition and actually stopped when Prohibition went on and they went a different direction, shut down at that point until you picked it back up again from your great-great-great-grandfather. So. Yeah, yeah, Kansas City really had a, a fantastic history. And while everyone focuses around alcohol and thinking that everything just survived in Kansas City, it just really wasn't the truth. And so you know, it's a, pe- people don't really fully understand what Prohibition did to the alcohol industry, uh, uh, unless you sort of put it in terms today of the way weed is treated, Mm -hmm. where people started to view weed as this, you know, sort of bad, sort of good thing. And what do you do with it? And back in those 19 teens, that's the way people were starting to feel about alcohol. So the Riegers were just unfortunately on the wrong side of the equation over the wrong, you know, three decades leading up to that era. And but we probably wouldn't be here today if it didn't happen the way that it was. Yeah, exactly. And then they they branched off and did something else. They went into mercantile, right? And uh, they went into banking. Yeah, and, and banking and mercantile. They yeah. just said, okay, Absolutely. we're, we're going to abide by the law. Yeah, instead of trying to go underground, exactly. and we're going to stay. You know, do do the speakeasy and all that, and then come back up. Okay, so it closes down. Nineteen nineteen goes away. Um, you're born and raised Kansas City in yep. uh, Shawnee Mission East High School, yep. I think, and then down to SMU. Yep. What was the decision in high school to go to SMU? Uh, it was really, really simple, twofold. One was that I wanted to go to a place. I, I knew that I wanted to be in the general financial world in terms of private equity or investment banking, and SMU had a great track record with placement of children based on the kids that were pre-admitted into the business school mm-hmm. before they were coming in as a recruiting tool. And so I was one of the 40 kids that was pre-admitted into the business school prior to my freshman year. And so seeing that that trajectory was already, like I said, when we started, we made the plans. <laughs> That's the right. plans were laid out for you. You followed the way that it was, uh, the roadmap was given to you. And so was able to fortunately get the job that I wanted coming out of college. But the other side was uh, one of my father's best friends. I'll never forget the conversation in his kitchen when talking about schools and I was in high school. He said, uh, Andrew, whatever you do, my... He was the only person still alive that calls me Andrew, by the way. And he goes, you Andrew. keep talking about my hair. I'll keep calling you Andrew. Okay? Done. Done. <laughs> uh, so he, he said to me, he goes, Andrew, uh, get the hell away from Kansas City. And he said, you can always come back. That's right. But if you stay here, it's going to be very hard for you to ever leave. So go explore the world while you can. And at that moment in time, when I was on the fence as to did I want to leave or not, it was a pretty simple way to put it, and in that perspective and in that light, I said, yeah, to hell with it. Let's do it. Yeah. And like I said, without all that, who knows if we'd even be sitting here today. Yeah, exactly. And then, so when you get out of school, get a job right away, and are you in da- you're in Texas at that point, right? Are you in the Metroplex at that point and working for a company yeah. there? And you're probably figuring, man, this is I'm, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, and I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And my, my career trajectory is going nowhere but up at that point. Yeah, so so I was supposed to be the college class of 2010, and I was able to finish school a little bit early because putting yourself back there 15 years ago, that was the end of the financial recession. And when the financial recession was coming to an end, no private equity firms, no investment banks, none of them were hiring anybody right. from the class of 09. So here they were six months after the fact, and I was going to graduate early and sort of take a semester off. And several of the good employers in the Dallas Metroplex 
said, if you graduate early, we'll literally guarantee you that you get the job, but you have to start in January because we need an analyst class immediately. Right. And so I was able to take advantage of the circumstances, hop forward into there. And then, yes, to your point, I mean, it was uh, four years, five years of working in that industry in the Dallas general area between downtown and the uptown area. Right. And during those years, that was when we started planning out the revival of Jay Rieger and co. So as you're working the other job, okay, during your, your financial and during your investment banking thing, you had that in the back of your mind the whole time to, to give a rebirth to a Jay Rieger co. Yeah. So the, the real story, um, you know, it's a 60 minute podcast, so we, we have time at least. Oh, we have so, time. Sure. So the, the real story was in the summer of 2010, my father was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer that he died with nine weeks later after his diagnosis. Oh, gosh, and I'm during sorry. that time period, uh, oddly enough, I was 23 years old. Uh, we found out on my 23rd birthday and I was living in Dallas when my dad was 23 and he graduated college. He was working for a bank in Dallas and his mom also got cancer, and he ended up moving home in order to be with his dad and to be with mm -hmm. his mom every day. When he got his cancer, he told me, absolutely do not move home because of me or this. Only move home if you ever have a legitimate reason. And his rationale was he always wondered, what if? What if he didn't move home to be closer to his dad when his mom was dying in order to comfort his dad? His dad would have been fine, but his, my dad's life would have been completely different. So he didn't want me to make what he felt was one of his mistakes. Mm -hmm. But with all of that, during that time period and about four weeks before he passed, there was an article that came out in the old Kansas City Star where it had uh, this restaurant that was going to restart in a historic building in the crossroads that used to house the Rieger Hotel. Mm -hmm. And the Rieger Hotel was something that our family built and ran for the five years leading up to Prohibition to coincide with Union Station reopening. And when they were able to build that, it was the marketing arm for the distillery. So anytime people would come into Kansas City and they would go into Main or go down Main Street, probably on the streetcar line sure. that was original, right across the Main Street Bridge, over the railroad tracks, heading north into downtown, first intersection was 20th and Main. So when you were at that intersection, you had to see this three-story mural, which was a bottle of whiskey, right. and it was Jay Rieger & Co. <laughs> so that was arguably your first impression of Kansas City. So you, you skip forward all these years, and you know Prohibition ended that. They sold it off, changed hands. But it went on the National Registry of Historic Places, and it was called the Historic Rieger Hotel. So the guys that started a restaurant there, one was the up-and-coming cocktail guy of Kansas City who was bringing good cocktails to Kansas City for the first time. One of them was one of the top up-and-coming chefs in the city, Howard Hanna. And so between Ryan Maybe, who was the cocktail guy, and Howard mm -hmm. Hanna, they were reviving this building or this brand more or less, not from a distilling standpoint, but just trying to make it historically relevant with good quality food and drink. And so my dad said to me, if I'm not around, make sure that when you come back for Christmas to visit your mom, you check this out so that someone with the last name Rieger is actually able to go in there. Right. That was it. So I walked in when that restaurant opened in December of 2010. It was their second night they were open and just started having conversation didn't want anything. They were wary of me. They didn't know if I was uh -oh. meaning well or not. <laughs> uh, and I came back the next night. And Plus, I, you're an investment banker. Right. Uh oh. Exactly. We're in trouble here. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I came back the next night with a manila envelope full of photocopies of various J. Rieger and Co. historical items, family mm -hmm. items, because they were trying to build this uh, mosaic wall, more or less, out of the the history right. of the family and brand. And when I came back the second night, I go, hey, here's everything you need. Just frame these and put these on your wall, and you guys you guys nailed it. Good job. And that was the night then that we started the conversations yeah. on the distilling side of things. And so from that, I was in Dallas, obviously, and we just kept talking over the next, you know, call it year and a half, more or less. And then as part of a, a big master plan, because I was doing exactly what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and I had no interest in being an investor. I had no interest in uh moving back home. I had no interest in leading the effort, nothing. So it really fell into play where uh, I was giving things to the cocktail guy, Ryan. And he always says this is part of his secret master plan. Uh, he wouldn't do them. And I would say, well, I want to see this happen. So I'll make these phone calls for mm -hmm. you. And, and that happened a few times. And then I just sort of kind of morphed it away from this idea of a bar that happens to make alcohol into this distillery that doesn't welcome people at all. And for our first five years when we restarted, 
we were purely a manufacturer trying to figure out ourselves. And it was probably hindsight, the right decision and the right direction for us to go to not only raise money, but to build a sustainable business model. Yeah, right. You started slowly and you didn't, you know, just didn't, you know, you took it step by step by step, which is the business plan you probably always, always had. But I think Ryan maybe was was pretty instrumental in this, right? Is to try, at least they did, oh, yeah. did they give you a free meal at least the second night you came well, so, in? So, so it's funny. So <laughs> that's what he says to everybody too. He's always like, yeah, so the first night we didn't give him a free drink. The second <laughs> night we brought him a free appetizer and gave him a free drink. There, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. So f- from that point on, how did everything else morph or start to morph for, for your company? So, so you know, I, I'll never forget some of the the big startup points. And anytime anybody asks us, would you do it all over again? I say, hell no, because I'm a very firm believer in luck. Everyone's like, well, you make your own luck. And it's like, yes, but at the end of the day, we all have to, to have a lot of luck in our lives in order to get to wherever we yeah, want to sure. go. And in order to not be an asshole, that is obviously. That's true. Uh, sorry, you might need to bleep that no, out. No, he doesn't need to. So We're on so, a podcast. There we go. <laughs> From that, uh, you, you know, as I was planning everything out and doing it from pretty much an investment banker's chair on a daily basis, both mentally and physically, when trying to build something up, you come across always the problems. And and my role in the investment bank was we always worked on what we called unhappy companies. And so those are companies that are coming out of bankruptcy, entering bankruptcy, business model is antiquated, whatever it may be. And so the goal there is you always had to fix them make things right, then do whatever capital change you need, and then go sell the business. So having that mentality in life where you are always trying to focus on preventing the negatives from occurring is a totally different approach than always trying to reach for the positives. Right. And when you fix all the negatives so they can't occur, you're just left with the positives. And so it's by order of elimination. So from that, I'll never forget one of the first questions that I had for um, Ryan when I was still planning on not being involved at all. And I said, who, now that this distribution model is what you know, you agree is a better route, who is going to make the alcohol? And he said he was. And I go, okay, well, what experience do you have? He said, none. And he goes, but I'm going to figure it out. And I go, okay. So raising capital, that's a terrible answer. Yes, to have that's not, not the way to expert. approach somebody to invest in your company, right? So, so he's like, well, I know the guy that used to run Maker's Mark. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa hold on. You know the guy that ran Maker's Mark? And he's like, well, yeah. He's like, I, I, you know, I met him a couple months ago at this event in New York. And he's like, yeah, I'll help you guys if you need help with whatever you're doing at the distillery. And I go, why would you not have told me that? Like, that's a really <laughs> big fact. So we got in touch with him, and he fell in love. And yeah, I'll never forget a comment that he said when this gentleman who was the master distiller and chief operating officer of Maker's Mark previously, he goes, I want to be a partner in this business. I really think it's an incredible approach to the business, and the fact that the family is going to be involved is just the icing on the cake. We hung up, and I called Ryan, and I go, do you think he knows that I'm not going to be involved whatsoever and i'm just helping facilitate this startup and he's like i ah, will figure it out <laughs> a couple months later i was like who's going to help with distribution and he, ryan again said i am and from there i said well eh, you don't really have that under your skill set And he's like well my, this guy who's my mentor uh he's worked for diageo all over the world he's done all oh, these side things he knows everybody and how to handle this maybe we could talk to him and it was like why are we talking about these people like after, After the fact, the, yes, we need to be talking about these up front. Like it would have changed everything. Right, with the number approach. two, Ryan knows everybody. It's like as it as it turns out, right? For the business, exactly what you're looking for. So, so <laughs> it was a. So we started talking to this guy's name was Steve Olson, and he said the exact same things that the Maker's Mark guy said. It wanted to be a partner, loved it for all the right reasons, and again hung up. And I go, well, you're gonna have to tell him that I'm not involved. And Ryan was like, yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out at some point down the road, and then. As we kept talking to the Steve guy, he kept saying that he could convince the gentleman who ran Tanqueray to leave Tanqueray to become an owner to start the gin program. And you're just like listening to this as an investment banker in Dallas. You're like, what the hell is going on on these phone calls? Like, there's no way any of this is real or possible with a random distillery that doesn't exist in Kansas City. So started talking to then even the guy that ran Tanqueray, and he was in. And it was just this bizarre culmination of people in their life where they were ready for a change right and they all came together at the right time and it just was uh, so bizarre that you know the reason why we have vodka and gin now is because this guy made all the tanqueray and all the smirnoff for 25 30 years the reason why we have a whiskey program is because not only was jay rieger and co whiskey dominant but we had the guy that ran maker's mark for Right. 14 years as the master distiller and COO. So you have these products that are made by the right people that teach our team how to make them and you do them in the right way. And then there was a summer of 2013 that my wife just looked at me in our uh, apartment in Dallas. She goes, remember how your dad told you to never move home? 
And I go, yeah. She goes, I'm pretty positive that this is the reason why he was saying this is what you should move home for. Yeah. And it had never hit me that that was what I was doing. But because I was unemotionally helping build up a business startup, I was doing it as an investment banker, right. not as an emotional investor or partner in the opportunity. And so from there, as you sort of took yourself away from that original mentality that we all do when we're trying to plan our mm -hmm. own lives, and you realize you've planned it for yourself without realizing you've been planning it for yourself, you wind up with something that actually is a good business, not just something that's emotional. Yeah. So your wife, is she from... Was she from Texas? She's actually from a small town outside St. Louis called Cuba, Missouri. Okay, and yes. She, and she went to Mizzou and then moved to Texas after she graduated, right. and we happened to meet at a party in Texas. So she was she was familiar with Kansas City for all part. I mean, maybe she was more familiar with St. Louis, but she knew the Midwest yes. at that point. Yeah. And it wasn't going to bother her to move from Dallas, Texas, and get out of that craziness that is the Metroplex down there move back to Kansas City where it's just a little bit saner. Yeah, I mean, we all recognize <laughs> that wherever we live in the world, once you start having a family, you don't live in the fun places that are hopping and right. going out randomly at 9 o'clock at night. You, you live in a suburb. Yeah. And so do you want to be in a suburb in Dallas, Texas, where it's 110 degrees all summer long, and it's in, you know, 9, 10-hour drive to St. Louis where the rest of her family is? Right. Or do you want to live in Kansas City where it's significantly more affordable? You're closer to everything family. going on. Mm -hmm. You're much closer to family. And it was a pretty easy decision. So when did you when did you just make that decision to go, okay, I'm all in? When did Ryan just go, well, I knew you would be, so I, it's no it, problem. It was, it was honestly <laughs> probably the summer of 2013. Okay. Uh, it was when we first started with needing money. And it was that whole moment with the discussion with Lucy. And then it was like, all right, well, if we're going to do this, then we need a little bit of seed money. And so I just put in a little bit of seed money to start buying a sure. few little things for proofs of concept. And it just ultimately, I mean, I remember getting samples sent to my apartment in Dallas from Chinese bottle manufacturers of various glass samples Gosh. that they were sending. You know, and you're like, it was really cool, though. Yeah. Because it's something new. You know, it's like this. If you got a microphone sent to your house, you'd be like, hell yeah. Yeah, this ain't bad. This I ain't really neat. on this thing. This is great. But in a studio like this, they're like, <laughs> oh, that microphone came like three days late. Yeah. What is it doing here so late? Yeah, and, it, and, and for, the timing was also good because there was so much going on in this type of an industry where it wasn't the Jim Beams and the well, – it all of a sudden it, it was all these sort of – and even though Rieger had a name – from back in Prohibition, you had to regenerate that name again here. But the idea was you and the were the restaurant helped with that. Right. And, and the craft brewing company for beers or whatever, and craft brewing distilleries for alcohol, everything was starting to surge at that point, I think, as well. Boulevard had taken yep. off and, and the whole thing at that point. And you could probably see that master plan and how that happened and how they did it. And uh, I think the timing ended up being perfect, too, didn't it? Oh, yeah. So I, I always uh, – just earlier this week I was having this conversation on, as we started this segment out, the luck of timing. And think about in 2014 when we relaunched. We relaunched October 30th of 2014. As you opened up this podcast, you said that we did it at the 100-year celebration for Union Station, which is right. totally true. So here we were reviving this brand at the 100-year celebration of our gorgeous Union Station – fortuitous. The Royals had just been eliminated from by the Giants, Giants that right. year. and But it didn't matter in Kansas City. I mean, it, I for a fact, you were definitely at the play-in game in 2014 against the A's. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> there's never been a better moment, in my opinion, in sports, for live sports at least, in Kansas City as it was that 30-year buildup of just begging for Please. some level of success Anything. within the organization. Mm -hmm. So we were on an all-time high, even though we lost the World Series. You had those come around, and then here was this brand that was being introduced that was elegant, priced affordably, and good. And Kansas City at that time was starving for something that they could say was their own that fit all those general characteristics. Right. And so we just lucked out because everybody was starving for something like what we were going to be creating and bringing out. And so when it happened... It was just the most easy transaction or transition from we as Kansas City don't have something that we can call our own to, right. oh, this is ours. We're good with it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah now, now we do, and now we're going to buy it. Now we're going to, you know, because people in Kansas City, they take care of their own. 
And I think that's really important. I think that's why Boulevard took off so well. Um, I know that's why you guys took off so well. You had a local name, local owner, um, guys who are doing something different and really bringing Kansas City more to the forefront, not only nationally, but now you're international as well. Yeah. So. No, it's been, uh, you know, it, it's been a fun ride overall to see the way that it works. And you know, because we have set ourselves up as as a business, not just a hobby. Right. And, you know, so many – there's so many small breweries and distilleries out there. And, you know, we always get caught up with general public perception. What I'll always say also is Kansas City's view of us is different than Washington, D.C.'s view of us. Right. Because in Washington, D.C., we are not looked at as local. People are like, oh, you've passed the test. You're – selling a couple hundred cases of booze every month here, bars, liquor stores. Right. You're, you must have a good brand, good quality, good price point, good people behind it that aren't scaring people away, whatever that is. Right. And so, but in Kansas City, you can get caught up in a little bit of the, oh, well, we just buy them because they're local. And you're sometimes, our goal right now is how do we ensure people know that we're not just a small shop that's a bar with a little window and right. we make alcohol in the back. But instead, this is a business, and we have over 100 people that work for us, and we are in 27 states and three countries, and you know, how do you get people to recognize that, that we're not just local? Right. And, and it's kind of a backwards thing that we deal with on a daily basis that we almost have to beg people to say, judge us based on what we're doing, because we are local. But like, when you're fighting for us with someone from Chicago, you got to know what to say to say that we are yours. You can't just say, well, this is the best local distillery. It's right. because why? And that's ultimately what our, more or less, this is, we're about to hit nine years. We've been open. We're entering into this phase of how do we ensure everybody really knows that what we're doing is just kicking ass because we'll get people from all over the country that come to the distillery and they say the same thing. They say, I've been to distilleries all over, distributors especially. All they do is just go to distilleries, talk to people, understand the landscape. And we do not have a single time that distributors come to our facility and don't say, easily the best distillery in the country. Yeah. Plus, you're winning awards for what you're distilling. Okay, you're winning all kinds. So all of a sudden, that piques everybody's interest as well. Yeah. Right? The, the, I mean, the, the award side of things, going back to, if the ultimate teachers for you and your art form are the guy who is considered the top gin distiller to ever live on planet Earth, and he's an owner, the guy who is the father of American whiskey, who regrettably passed away in 2018, those people taught your team how to produce or how to do their craft. And when you think about the level of apprenticeship that goes into distilling that is traditional, mm -hmm. as opposed to the YouTube society that we have become where <laughs> anybody can sit in front of a microphone now, right? Like, sure. Frank can't be that good at it. Right. Like, I'm who, as good as he is. Who, I, everybody told me that about my job anyway when I was on TV. I was I'm better than he is. I used to call and say, go tell my GM he'd probably hire you in a minute, you know? But nobody did. So that's that was important. Exactly. At that point. Or I wouldn't be here right now. Totally. <laughs> totally. The uh it, it, so it's it's the same. I mean, it's you know, it, it's the critiques that you can receive or the praise that you can receive, where they're coming from and are they genuine or not. But you, you get to that phase where who would you rather be set up? I mean, I would much rather have you teach me how to be a sportscaster mm. than my wife. My wife could read 87 books, but it's just you've done it for so many years mm -hmm. that, of course, you're going to know the tips and tricks. And it's just those little nuanced details where you ask a question educated to those individuals specifically on the distilling side. And our head of production is a science guy. And so he comes around and he'll ask methodologies as to why we're doing something or why we don't do it a certain way. Right. And normally, all of his inquiries get met with specific case studies. Well, we don't do it like that because... Let me tell you a story about in 1989 when I tried it like that, and this was the result. Right. And our head distiller is just like, oh, well, yeah, that totally makes sense. Like, yeah. it would have taken me four days to figure out that Trial final answer. Yeah. But, like, yeah, like, of Research course. and development, yeah, well, whatever. What all the great companies do with all their stuff, before they throw it out to the public, they want to make sure it's right. So I always defined it as a fork in the road. Mm -hmm. And I said we took the cheat code. by We bought the fork so that anytime we had a question – we could determine, as long as we knew what the two paths were, we had the ability to find the right answer before we moved forward down that fork in the road. So we can always take the right forks right. in the road and ensuring that when you get to the very end, you've taken the right paths and you did it very quickly as opposed to your 
term, trial and error, right. which could take on whiskey side of things years. Yeah. And before we start talking about this story and the certain products, let's go back to the hotel, the restaurant, and Manifesto. Yep. I love Manifesto. And I know into the story now you have a Manifesto area. You know, there was just – that place was so unique, and I loved – the urinal in the men's room, which is classic, and Al Capone pissed here. It was just, it was in a classic building, the historic building, manifesto through the beads, couldn't see anything, uh, very small area. Bartenders were great. They mixing these different drinks to smoke this and, the, you know, the rye this. And yeah. The whole thing to be able to try and just the whole atmosphere was just incredible. Yeah. yeah. It, it, was, how tough it was what we was always that? said. What we always, but that was literally the foundation of bartending in Kansas City. Right. Manifesto. And so for so many years, you could trace people's lineage of bartending education in Kansas City on every spot that was good to some degree of they learned from somebody that was at Manifesto. And it was truly the godfather bar right. of Kansas City that created all of this talent throughout our entire Metroplex. Yeah, right. And how tough was it when came time they had to close that? They had to close the hotel and close that whole operation down. So, was so, that tough? Well, so so full disclosure, I wasn't involved in the operations or finances right. of that business. And so it was tough from the standpoint that us as Jay Rieger and co, that was our sister business. I mean, uh, clearly, I mean, throughout history, we were connected. You know, we worked together so often on just building up really good things for Kansas City, whether they be food or drink. Mm -hmm. And so having that, you know, legitimately that sibling die, it sucked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it completely was. It sucked for and me. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> it was terrible. For, for all A of bad us. Bad idea. <laughs> uh, and that was just, you know, one of the unfortunate outcomes of COVID and yeah. what we all had to deal with and had to see. And so, you know, I mean, no one has ever left unharmed in these types of scenarios. Yeah. And uh, it, it it's all going to end up being great. And everybody that worked mm -hmm. there got great jobs. And so it, none of that is the issue. It's just the legacy and heritage. But, you know, I think the little bit of the flip side that we all think about, too, is all good things can come to an end. Yeah. And you can either have your last memory of something be poor or you can have that last memory be you wanting more. Right. And I think that having that last memory always being you wanting more is way more special yeah. than you being sick and tired of it and moving on yourself. Yeah, right. Instead of I'm sick of this, I want to get rid of this. That wasn't the way it happened. Yeah. Hurt a little bit. But, totally. But it was. But your experiences uh, are even positive today. I mean, it's been closed exactly. for three years now. Oh, gosh. And Loved it. You yeah, know, it was a great place. We'll still talk positively and, about it forever. And COVID for you guys was an unbelievable transition. You already have the alcohol there. You're making alcohol or whatever, and you decide to go to uh, making the sanitizers and everything else for the area. How, how'd, how'd that come about and just transition? You really started to help locally, and then all of a sudden it became – you started to help nationally. So the – at the very beginning of COVID, it was – what was the date? March 9th or something Yeah. when the NBA announced at they were shutting like down. 7 p.m. that they were going to shut down right. for – you know, at that time also, uh, I'll never forget on, it was the day before that, that uh, I was at the distillery and there was a, um, something with sporting was going on at the distillery that day. And I was sitting with Jake Reed having a drink and he was telling me all about the league and what was going on. And again, this was still the early phase where people were like, the what? Uh, Jake said that there they had a game that was supposed to be in Columbus, you know, that next Tuesday or something along those lines, and they canceled it. And he goes, yeah, he goes, they canceled it because four people in the entire state of Ohio got this virus. Mm -hmm. And he's like, can you believe that? And at that time, we were like, no, I can't believe that. That's insane. Or when school then was canceled for the right. rest of the school year, all those little bits and pieces. But for us, we knew that we had just finished our building. And so what I mean by that is we started in 2014 – and we ran this as a manufacturing operation in a 15,000-square-foot warehouse. And then we per had purchased in 2017 three acres, redeveloped a 50,000-square-foot historical yeah. building that comprises part of our complex now. Down Electric and so, Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from that, what you saw was we had built something where we were trying to get people to come to a neighborhood in Kansas City in which they otherwise wouldn't. And we built it to be – very big in the carrot side of things. So a lot of people wanting to come down for a mm -hmm. lot of different reasons. Your first impressions were built to be immaculate. And then the staff and the presentation of everything was meant to be 
so exquisite that you're thinking, oh, I don't care where this is located, I have to come back. And now you couldn't have anybody. And so here we had just built this mega facility where people weren't even allowed to go out. And we were, honestly, I was like, we're scared to death. I was like, we're screwed. <laughs> like, this is, we're going under. I'm going to need to call the bank. <laughs> I'm going to need to call the tax credit people. Like, we are SOL. You know, all these great ideas you had, they just went in the toilet. That was it. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, we started out what everybody did, which was you know, whatever is a silly thought, you know, food to go, yeah. dumb stuff. Because uh, we had kitchen, we had staff. And I was just very, I'll never forget, it was the first Monday night of that first full week. And I was on the phone at 11.30 p.m. talking to a gentleman who runs U.S. Engineering here in town. And he was just trying to check on me and just like, What's, yeah. what are your thoughts? Like, Is the bill going to be do? paid? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, fortunately, he was not worried about that. Right. Uh, and <clears throat> when I hung up with him, I just remember thinking to myself, officially, this is going to be it. And I'll never forget going home that night. And I literally walked in my house and my wife was still – full time at the business at, at that point. And she and I got home at like 1130 at night, 12 o'clock at night, whatever it was, babysitter was there with the, our, we had one kid at the time. And I just collapsed on my knees and I just cried. And mm. my wife just like came down next to me and she was like, it's gonna be okay. And I go, it's so unfair that we have done everything right. Everybody wants people to start businesses in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We got all the best people involved and because of something completely out of our control, we're probably going to lose it all. And so it was that really hard moment. Mm -hmm. So the the next day, I think it was my wife got a call from a nursing home here in Kansas City saying, we're out of hand sanitizer. Can you guys help us? Wow. We saw uh, a distillery in Seattle doing this for a nursing home. And my wife brought it to me, and I go, yeah, no. I go, what they're doing in Seattle is marketing. They don't understand the severity of what's actually going on, and so they're making a mockery of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And they made two – this distillery in Seattle made 200, like, two ounce bottles of hand sanitizer, things that are not gonna move the needle for keeping a business afloat, right. things that are not gonna move a needle for keeping people safe, just a completely worthless PR exercise. And so that's where my brain was. So I just quickly dismissed it. A couple of days later, they called back and my wife approached me again and was like, look, could we just do it for these people? And so we got everybody in the room that uh, was in management and I said, if we do this, we're gonna do it. And I have to know, though, is everybody in? Right. Because we're not going to have time to have meetings and set right. things up. And I'm just going to take it's here. I'm just going to take full control. Mm -hmm. And I need to know that everybody is on board. And we went around right. the room and every single person said, yes, 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 yes. And so as soon as we got out, we started. And I mean, there were you know a handful of us that were really leading the charge in terms of we need more of this. We need more of that. We need more of this. Yeah, you had to learn how that. to make the sanitizer. 100%. You had the alcohol, but you had to learn how to exactly. and do you had to the find whole thing. The other components of it as well. And so our team was running all over the town, just trying to gather enough components. And then we got, you know, obviously once we started it, our very first day was a Thursday. I think we made a couple thousand jugs of hand sanitizer thinking. Yeah, you're making jugs. Oh, you're not is. making this. Right. You're making five-gallon, three-gallon. Two, two liter jugs. Two liter, yeah. two liter jugs. And, and from that, uh, <clears throat> the – demand was unlike anything we had ever experienced in our lives before. And so people were staying there at the facility all night. I mean, we set up makeshift packaging lines for it. But the coolest thing was we had 70 people that were on our team. We never fired a single person start to finish. And that was my commitment to them. I said, if you all stay here and help us survive right now, mm -hmm. when we have no money coming in in four weeks, 10 weeks, four months, whatever that is, we'll keep everybody. Right. And so it was kind of a gamble on my end, but we had to try to do something. And so from that, not only were we making it and having, you know, two mile long lines, we had one day we had 16 police officers just conducting oh, traffic uh, around the area, helicopters. I mean, just crazy stuff all around. But the craziest thing was we saw people in their raw element. And it's a very bizarre way to say that. Yeah, fear. But well, maybe. A actual fear from maybe. those people in their eyes, yeah. But you know that at that moment in time, people are at an ultimate low. You, you're not allowed to go to your office. You're not allowed to go socialize with your friends. You're struggling to find supplies. Borderline uh, end of earth type scenario. Right. And fortunately in America, we didn't really think that would actually happen, but it was a fear in everybody's eyes. 
And so we saw people that were caring for others. We saw people that were hateful towards others. Mm. We saw people that felt they could help certain ways and did. We saw people that had no way to help, so asked us what they could do. And some of the coolest stories from that were company came in and said, I want to buy a pallet of hand sanitizer and take it to all the police stations. And we said, that's really nice of you. And they go, we, they go, we make paper. And they go, we have no way to help right now. Mm-hmm. And they go, so we, we've just got to do something. And and they're so trying to keep what, their employees. They're, but they're just like, this is what we have to do mm-hmm. to help. Like, this sure. is our only our way. So you see those things, and you're really fascinated. We had people waiting in line for four hours that yeah. get out and then start screaming at our staff. And my wife walks over and goes, goodbye. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm. We don't want to serve you. And they would get mad at my wife and got in her face, and then cops walk right over. And they're like, I'm so sorry. The business owner has asked you to leave. Mm-hmm. Have a nice day. I'm like, next time be a good person. Yeah. Uh, and, and we had uh, one scenario that was, I showed up at seven in the morning on a Saturday morning and there was a person waiting. We were supposed to open at 11 for sales. We had an individual that was in a really nice Mercedes. And then behind him was two people in a very beat up 20 plus year old car. Went and talked to both because I wasn't going to make them wait for four hours in order to get hand sanitizer. First guy said he just wants a jug, saw us on the news, wants to help out. Second people said their mom's 86 years old, lives with them, can't find soap, can't find shampoo, mm-hmm. concerned for her health. Wow. Uh, clearly didn't have very much money. So I come back, and I was going to give them two jugs. First guy gives me a $100 bill and goes, use this to help pay for whoever else needs help during this time. Wow. And the back was like, oh, we have like $13. And I go, it's yeah. completely taken care of. Like, that guy just bought your hand sanitizer for you. Like, Make sure you take care of it. Yeah, and, and to me, it's a lot about what this podcast is all about. There's just something about Kansas City. There's just something about people in general, and let alone the people from here, that just make it what it is, just make it the city that it is. Because yeah. you know? I'm not from here originally, and now it's my home and has been since 1981. I wouldn't consider moving anywhere else. I wouldn't go back to my hometown in Pittsburgh. wouldn't go back to where I went to school in Philadelphia. You know, wouldn't go back to Green Bay, where I came down from. I uh, wouldn't go back to California on a bet, okay? <laughs> anyway, so it's just there is just something about this area. Well, it's so weird that you live in all these places with NFL teams. Yeah, I know. It's almost like you're crazy? a sports guy. Yeah, yeah almost. <laughs> but, but there is just something about it, right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's a uh, – you know, we were hitting on this earlier that Kansas City loves Kansas City and almost to a fault – because we love Kansas City so much, it's like, hey, let's look, make sure we're also looking around the world too. Yeah, right. Uh, and so it's it's a, like I said before, uh, to has having this conversation last night actually, that we have a very interesting period that we are in too right now, where we've had so much new life brought into our environment here in Kansas City over the last ten years, mm-hmm. and as we're coming out of COVID now, and as we are. Uh, getting away from low interest rates and tighter capital environments. I don't know if we're going to have the level of innovation that we've seen and that's really over the, I mean, we're talking about 12 years ago in 2010, there was not a lot of passion for Kansas City. Oh, the Chief, downtown was dead. I mean, downtown was dead. The Chiefs weren't good. The no. Royals weren't good. You know, new fun companies weren't popping up everywhere. And here we are today, and it's a completely different scene. And we yeah. have all of this hometown pride. And you just hope that at the end of the day, we're able to sustain love for what we are doing here in the city as a whole. Yeah, but absolutely. You got to prepare for it to revert back something to the mean. Well, you're definitely a showpiece for KC. Uh, Rieger is. Uh, Rieger's Kansas City Whiskey, Rieger's Midwestern Dry Gin. We talked about, <clears throat> you know, we talked about the gin and vodka guys, and we talked about the whiskey guys, and Cafe Amaro. Uh, Amaro and cold uh, brew ca- caffeine, which is great. You got Rieger's Midwestern Premium Vodka. Left for Dead, which I find fascinating for me because you have a spirit distilled from Boulevard's cast-offs, yes. from Boulevard Brewing Beer cast-offs, yep. and you mix them to get, uh, together somehow yeah. to make this product. So it's it just essentially, I mean, so, you know, and that's a fun one that we haven't done in a, a long time, and it's people still talk about it. But the idea for it was there was all this beer that Boulevard dumps for whatever reason. It's out of spec, out of it gets out of temperature, uh, the fermentation didn't go exactly as planned, whatever it was. So how did you how does that then figure into alcohol as far as whiskey's concerned? So how so, did how'd you guys go about doing it? Well, so that? so beer is the industry term for fermented mash. 
So right. we take fermented mash and we distill it. The industry term for that is beer because you have a mix of grain, water, and alcohol now in a vat. And so it's no different than beer. So from the beer standpoint, it's just much more refined because that was intended to be the final product. So we just take all that beer, and, or at least we did when we made the product set, and we would put it in the still, and we would literally distill it off so you more or less concentrate it. So think of drinking a, uh, when you used to drink a Boulevard Pale Ale, and it was, I don't know what it was, 5% alcohol, yeah, right. whatever it was. <clears throat> well, for us, we were making it, and you could drink Boulevard Pale Ale uh, concentrated to, you know, 40, per, 40% alcohol. <laughs> and so it was, it was quite a different, it had the same general flavors, but right. it was just a, uh, a hybrid whiskey beer, more or less at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah, 89 but, proof. And then, yeah, and then, because that was the year Boulevard was founded. <laughs> right, 89, uh, exactly right. And, and so from that, the idea Left for Dead was just, there was all this beer that was literally Left for Dead. And when we first started out, our head distiller came from the lab at Boulevard. And he oh, was, he there's, was, he there's was joking a connection, with, yeah. Well, and we were renting from John McDonald, mm -hmm. who owned the building that we were in. And that's who we bought all of our complex from. And uh, our head distiller, Nathan, he said to me one day, he goes, God, it's so funny to see how much whiskey we're putting in barrels compared to how much beer Boulevard throws away. And I go, throws away? I go, what do you mean by that? And that was the origin of the idea for working with them on a project that was fun and collaborative, and we had a good time All right. with it. And here's two companies that cross over, I mean, and, and get along. Yeah. I mean, just cross over. There, there's a lot of companies that would go, you know, the beer's mad at the whiskey, and the whiskey's mad at the beer because they're stealing their customers. Whereas everybody's really drinking the alcohol. So what, what are we worried about yes. here, right? It's like the first time I had Tank 7. I think I was at uh, Boulevard's deal upstairs, and uh, I was at a thing for Kansas State or something. It was, a, it was a charity fundraiser or something for Kansas State. And I went over and I said, oh, I think I'll try this new thing from, from Boulevard. I'll try this Tank 7 stuff. And she gives it, the bartender gave it to me in like a little six or seven ounce glass. I said, well, it's because it it's new. Glass. Right. It, it's new. And so I had a little sip. I had one that went, it was really smooth. And I said, oh, that's pretty good. Went back and had another. Then I was going to go back and have my third. And she goes, are you sure? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, I'm feeling our hand really move it, you know, like this. And she goes, uh, that is uh, pretty high in alcohol content <laughs> right there. I said, Take a water, Frank. Right, yeah, absolutely. So when you have people into the distillery and you, you send them through the tours and everything you do down there with the food and electric park and everything you're developing there, talk about the whole district itself and how that has come along. Yeah, so, so when we were <clears throat> trying to grow the business and we acquired our properties in 2017, we had to bring people down for the first time. And what I mean by the first time is we're right by Knuckleheads. So right. a lot of people know Knuckleheads, and they have no idea there's anything around Knuckleheads. And you can even say, oh, we're right next to Knuckleheads, and people will look at you as if we just yeah. spoke Chinese. Yeah. And they'll say, where? Like <laughs> literally right across the railroad you know, tracks. The, yeah, the tracks the are right there. The train runs right building by. building with <laughs> lights on it and signs and people always walking in and out. Like, what are you talking about where? Like, where else would it be? One of the crack houses down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's true. Truth. That's, that's truth true. right there. Uh, no, but 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 the idea really then was uh, I said a little this a little bit before. You had to figure out how to get people down. You had to do enough critical mass to bring people down. That's why we have all these different concepts from a large social lounge to a high end cocktail bar in the basement to a quarter acre garden bar outside. Everything has different drinks, different food, different ambiance, different decor, so that it's truly a district for adults. And we always say that people that our target market are people that find $10 cocktails appropriate. Right. And what I mean by that is we don't have Red Bull. We don't have uh, cheap alcohol or beer. We don't have shot glasses. So we eliminate the people that are looking for those types of experiences at night. So we don't deal with fights. We rarely deal with vomit. Uh, you deal with truly adults. And it's a really wonderful set to be working alongside when those are the people that are coming in and 25-year-olds are drinking with 75-year-olds alike because right. everybody is enjoying a professional drinking environment. And so thinking about what we had to do, not just was it about that critical mass, but you know, as an organization, we have now more or less three businesses. We have this manufacturing and distribution of alcohol. We have this on-site hospitality business and because we own all the concepts that are in our real estate. And the third one is a real estate. And so we're not willing to rent a building from somebody right. and redevelop it in order to eventually lose it in the future or be held hostage. So we kind of go at the pace at which people are willing to part with their parcels in our neighborhood. And so the idea as a whole of being able to revive that area started with um, me recognizing that branding was necessary for that neighborhood because we're in the larger East Bottoms neighborhood, which is not descriptive, and people inherently believe West Bottoms when you say East Bottoms. Right. So 
I just one day, as part of my researching, I just decided I was going to call it Electric Park. And so in every interview, I just started saying, we're located in the historic Electric Park District in Kansas City. And I got the Parks District to change the name of the park grounds that are right there back to Electric Park. Yeah. So that it had some form of official thing as to why we were calling it that neighborhood. We named the bar, the outdoor garden bar, Electric Park Garden Bar. Right. And so really trying to bring it back in that sense. But it's such a better, fun way to create brandability or history lessons for people when you're involving it with alcohol and you're making it a cool name as well. Right. And then right there on the premises, you also have different areas for different things. You have the Hey Hey Club, you've got DJs, you've got bands, you've got everything. I think you have a, a private as, as well. You have a manifesto there as well. So it's all been, it's all come full yeah, circle so the, for the, you, right? The Hey Hey Club is the high-end cocktail bar in the basement. Right. Uh, the Which we do once a year. We do a manifesto takeover week. Um, so we go back to old school cocktails, which we're getting to the point now where some people that have moved to Kansas City in the last few years, they're coming in and they're like, what's manifesto? Right. And it's like, uh, it's a gut wrenching for us to like not know that people understand what this bar was and what it was for Kansas City. Uh, the monogram lounge is upstairs. It's the large social lounge that overlooks the production floor. And then the garden, Electric Park Garden Bar is outside. But yeah, I mean, from we have a 4,000 square foot historical exhibit. We've got a large tasting room. We do tours. We've got a slide. It goes from the second floor to the first floor. Uh, we've had a 99-year-old take the slide. And oh, so my gosh. That, that's the record. Uh, he's 100 now, and he said that he is going to come back, back and take the slide. Uh, we've got a really cool barrel dining room as well, and we've got a few other properties that we're looking to try to redevelop in the future. And, again, the point is that we're trying to revive this neighborhood. Right. And it's always of my view that you cannot revive neighborhoods by doing market rate projects. And so anytime somebody is redeveloping something and they're able to finish it at a level that the current people in that neighborhood can afford to rent it, right. you're not taking it to the next step and really trying to improve it. You're just prolonging everything. Yeah, exactly. And so on our end, that's why we have to own it, and that's why we have to own the concepts that go within because it's not a three- to five-year strategy what we're doing. We're trying to be the caretakers over the next 20 to 30 years, and it's a slow build. But yeah. it's something that we have time, and we're going to try to do it the right way, and our neighborhood was the original foundation of Kansas City. It was where trading posts were set up with the Native Americans, and it was the original farm ground of Kansas City. So being in a historic neighborhood such as that with a historic brand like we have. It's really cool. Yeah. It that all, is really it cool. It all fits. It really is. And knuckleheads being there can't hurt. No. I mean, they come in. There's there's branding for you right away. It's right there. It's right down the street. And I'm sure you interact a little bit with <laughs> those guys as well. They're great people as well. Been we, there. I've had we the love train Frank. run through the back. Yeah. Other, other Frank. Yeah, the, the other Frank. Yeah, absolutely. Talk a little bit about, be, before we finish up here, talk a bit about the family. And the wife and the kids, and you know we got Pepper sitting in here in the studio. Yeah, got my dog, dog sitting in here. Yeah, just wonderful. But uh, just talk a little bit about that. And uh, as you settled back in here from Dallas, you've been here for a while now. But yep. and you feel you're back home. But just just talk a little bit. About yeah, no, family. we've got uh, I got two boys. Uh -huh. So before I had any kids, everybody would always ask on the tours. Um, oh, wow, well, so you're the last Rieger alive. So are there any kids on the way? <laughs> And as, as, as every guy knows that's in a position with uh, someone they're married to or engaged to, uh, when you're being asked those questions that early and yeah. that formalized element of the relationship, you're... And you uh, haven't asked her yet. You're like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah, someday, someday we'll have those kids. Yeah, right. So we got two boys. Uh, we got this beautiful, lovely dog sitting by our feet. Uh, and she goes to work with me every single day. Uh, she's great. Wife uh, started working at the distillery in 2016 mm -hmm. and was the first office hire that we ever had. So we had three people on the production team, and I was doing everything. And then she came in and started uh, taking over like the marketing right. and charity Need and a good partner. all of that stuff. Yeah. And then uh, in 2022, she stepped back when we had a whole marketing team built out. And so she get, wants to spend a little bit of time with the boys while they are in their really young youth yeah. years. And then wants to get back into things once they're back in school sure. and get back into the working world and knock it out. So it, Did you it's tell been, her she's going to have to reapply? Uh, of course. <laughs> You kidding me? <laughs> oh, I'm not hiring her. She can listen to this too. <laughs> you know, so if someone texts this <laughs> clip to her, and she's gonna be like, "Andy said this." <laughs> Andy said, like, you, you, "Hey, look, good, you've, you've got to reapply luck. like everybody else." Good luck. Good luck here. Yeah. We got to see your resume. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. yeah. Right. I see this gap. Yeah. Absolutely. Describe this gap. Uh, future plans for Rieger? Are we more expansion mm -hmm. and, like you said, just keep keep things growing? Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the interesting things about business in general and startups in general is that so often people view businesses as one of two things, a startup or a corporation. And you know, startups we view as 
you know, struggling for revenue, they're haphazard, they don't actually operate like a large company right. would. Then you have corporations that they're p profitable, they solve problems with money, they have people in the departments that you would expect, whatnot. But th there's that middle ground. And I really believe that that middle ground is like 80% of businesses that are trying to get to the corporation side, but are still at the lower revenue mm -hmm. scales as what these smaller. Right. They can't uh, get people interested in investing. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not necessarily bit. even investing. It's, <clears throat> it's just sustainability. Mm -hmm. Is the business self-sustaining in what it's doing? And so we're really at 24 is our big year for that. And so as we were kind of coming through, we're going to continue developing real estate. We're going to continue expansion of uh, our business in terms of the markets that we are in. We're going to continue to grow our distribution team. We're going to continue to be opportunistic with real estate and redevelopment in our mm -hmm. neighborhood to be additive to what we are trying to accomplish. We're going to continue to try to do all those right things because at the end of the day, again, I said this a few minutes ago, but we don't look at three to five year returns. Mm -hmm. we, we look at is what we are doing better for the long term picture and wherever that fits, that works great. But I always have one rule internally that I always share with our investors that anytime we spend money in terms of capital, it is going to some way, shape or form help all three of our business units, hospitality, distribution, and real estate. And so some way or another, it's going to make our neighborhood safer. It's going to bring more mm -hmm. people down to our neighborhood by creating brand awareness, and it's going to aid our distributors in their ability to sell our products by either giving them places to go, to send mm -hmm. people, or to be able to have just general brand awareness. Because a lot of times we recognize people don't want to learn about whiskey. They don't want to learn about gin. They don't want to learn about vodka because it's just not part of their core interest. Right. So if you don't want to learn about those things, I bet you, though, you're willing to socialize with your friends. Oh, yeah. I'm willing to drink it. So <laughs> so we'll, we'll have you down. And that's one of those where you come down, you have a great time. And then everybody says, sure. oh, my God, this is my brand. I'm going to buy this. Yep. I had such a great time when I went down there. They do such a good job. So you can gain market share in ways that are yep. non-traditional. And so this was our first year of marketing as well in a traditional sense. So we're just getting into all of these yeah. facets of this gearing towards this corporation element that things actually work and are self-sustaining. All the best to you, your company, Rieger and Company. We think it's great that you're here. You've brought back the name and, and doing it in, in such a great way and continued success and great success with your, with your family and the whole thing. We're just glad to have you here. And you're one of the reasons, Jay Rieger Co. is one of the reasons that um, there's just something about Kansas City. We appreciate Andy that. Andy Rieger. Thanks, Frank. A good man. Thanks, Great Paul. seeing you. All right, you too.